Amen. Good evening, church. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Matthew chapter 22. It's good. It's good to be a Baptist. Amen. <clears throat> you always know you're at a Baptist church because the front row is never taken up. There's always room. If anybody's struggling to find a seat. Um, you know, Spurgeon was a Baptist, but his, his parents were not. They were actually Methodists. And uh, one day, Spurgeon, you know, he was brought to Christ. He was saved and later uh, wandered into a Baptist church. And then there he was baptized. And after his baptism, his mother wrote him a letter. She said, Ah, Charles, I often prayed the Lord to make you a Christian, but I never asked that you might become a Baptist. He said in his response, Oh, Mother, the Lord has answered your prayer with his usual bounty and giving you exceedingly abundantly above all what you could ask or think. <laughs> it's good to be a Baptist, but it's really good to be a Christian. I want you to think about this thought with me. What if everybody in this room, what if we were to make much of Christ as soon as we walked out of this building? What would that look like? If just everybody in this room, I know that uh, the place is not packed out, but the faithful few that we have here tonight, what would happen if, if we took it as a personal responsibility, and when we left, not here while well, it's easy, but when we leave the building to make much of Christ, to make much, to take Christ into our home, to sit down with our children and to open the Bible together and to pray, not just at mealtime, not just when it's appropriate traditionally, but to break the rules and the customs that our, for, uh, that our fathers, that our you know, families have set for us and to follow Christ, to set a blazing trail for future generations. I wonder what that would look like. You ever wonder that? What would, ha what would happen if you and I were to make much of Jesus? You can follow Christ if you love him. If his love is in you tonight, you, I'm not talking to anybody else, I'm talking to you, you, you personally, you young person, you old person, you individual, you thought that you're not important, that you're not some big person that's in charge of all these different areas of ministry, you're just you, you can follow Christ and you can make a difference. The only thing that is stopping you is your own will. Tonight, I want to talk to you in Matthew chapter 22, a parable that Jesus gives. We're going to call this the guest list. I'm going to read for you this section of scripture, and then we'll pray. Matthew 22, verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took the, his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burnt up their city. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready. You hear that, church? The wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. He saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to his servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Would you pray with me?
Father, tonight here we are gathered again, and we have called this a revival meeting. But we know, Lord, we know that revival cannot come without your spirit breaking forth upon us. And we humble ourselves, Lord, and we ask you to be merciful. We are sinful. We are unworthy. God, you see through all the pretenses. You see through all the things that we say to others, the names that we carry, the reputations that follow us. God, you see inside the depravity of our hearts, the desperation in our nature. You know that we are hopeless, but Lord, you have come to us. As has been shared earlier, God, we confess the sins of our people, our nation. We are not innocent. You have called us to be the light of the world. And God, we have sit down. We have failed to carry the beacon. We have allowed our light to become marred with darkness. We've mingled with some of the idols in our generation. We've made light of the gospel. And so many, Lord, around us are fallen in the streets. They don't have an answer. They're even asking. And they don't know who Christ is, and they don't know the power of salvation. Lord, because we haven't gone, and Lord, we confess to you now, please change us and make us new. Make us, Lord, again. Burn with that fire of the passion that came whenever we first called on the name of Jesus. And for some here in this room tonight, it was so many years ago. Wake us up again. Please, Lord, please forgive us. Please, we pray this for your glory. Get us out of the way. I know, Lord, that I am nothing. I don't deserve the introduction that I received. God, you know me. It's only Jesus. We all here need him. Help us, Lord, to make much of Christ. Teach us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in the sanctuary. Everybody was sitting there. It was a beautiful giant chapel. There was a pipe organ on a balcony. This lady we hired was playing through a repertoire. And it was time for the wedding party to come. The, you know, the bridesmaids and all the little kids and all that stuff. And they didn't come. The doors didn't open, song after song after song, and I didn't get to know. I wasn't privy to the information. There was no walkie-talkies. I was just sitting there sweating with the pastor who was going to marry us. Every so often, people would kind of look behind themselves. And eventually, the organist, she decided she was done. <laughs> She's like, I, I played through my repertoire. This is what I was paid to do. I'm done. She got up and left. <laughs> and then there was this really awkward silence for about a minute, and I, the guy that was standing next to me, this is God's providence, he was standing next to me, he wasn't actually in the wedding, he was just a friend of mine, and he just so happened to be a concert pianist, amen, right? And there was a piano at the front, and without blinking, he runs up to the front, he sits down on the piano, from memory, he starts playing some Bach or Beethoven, like classical music, and then nobody knew what was going on. I thought, wow. Now eventually, you know, before the sun went down, my wife came through, the building, <laughs> we got married. <laughs> it wasn't her fault. Something about her dress wasn't put together. But I just wanted to give you a picture into our wedding because you probably connect that with a memory of your own. And you've got to get the imagery of a wedding here. Because this is the story that Jesus is giving to us to draw us a picture of what is being prepared for you and for me right now in heaven. You remember John, or in John when Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. Now he says this in the beginning of chapter 22. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like, this is what uh, it could be compared to. It's like a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Do you get the imagery? Is anybody catching what Jesus is putting down? A king is making a wedding for his son, and so he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. The word bidden there means invited. There were certain people that were already on the guest list, and now it was time for the wedding to get ready. So the servants went out, and, you know, in famous uh, ancient fashion, in 
the Jewish culture, they'd have this dance. They're going down the street, and they would call the people uh, that were invited to the wedding, and they would say, the wedding is ready. Come to the wedding. The Bible says that they would not come, those who were invited. Verse 4, and he sent forth other servants, saying, tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. This is the first group of people uh, that were invited to the wedding, and we're going to call this group of people the rejects. Okay? The rejects, this group of people rejected the invitation. They said, thanks, but no thanks. Notice here now the grace of God that's being told in the story because when they rejected the offer, the king sent the servants out a second time. And he said, go and tell them. Woo them. Remind them of the feast that's been prepared. All of the, the animals that have been killed and all the beauty and the decorations, they're all set. Don't you want to come to this wedding? Maybe, you know, there was this idea that they had forgot some of those details. The servants went back out to it. But that, then, at that invitation, the Bible says, verse 5, that they made light of it. So we're going to call this group of people the rejects. They rejected, and then they were rejected. They didn't care. Now, this kind of reminds me of the rich man that Jesus talked about, and we mentioned this last night. He wasn't a careless man. He cared, but he cared about the wrong things. Verse uh, five goes on to say that they went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. Why didn't they want to come to the wedding? Well, they had their reasons. The farm and the fun, the mansion and the merch and merchandise. Now, let me just make it plain for you. The wedding that is being prepared in heaven, this kingdom of heaven, is likened to this great festival, this great feast, this great celebration. What do you think heaven's going to be like? Some people imagine heaven as like this just endless, infinite cloud, gray and blue, and people are kind of floating around as ghostly figures with nothing to do. Bored, confused, like, why are we here? But the Bible describes it differently. It says it's a celebration. It says it's exciting. It's a place that you want to be. But they just didn't get it. The people that were invited, they just did not get it. They were too focused on what was right in front of them that they couldn't pay attention to this incredible offer that they were being offered. And the, the picture here that God is trying to draw for us is that he's saying, look, I know that you're concerned about things in your life. I know you've got stuff going on. You're busy. You've got your farm and you've got your stuff that you've got to take care of and everybody's got their taxes that they've got to pay and they've got their children and they've got all these other things. But here is God saying to us, there is something better that is being prepared. Are you paying attention? Are you paying attention? Are you going to come? When you are invited, are you going to come to the wedding? But they just didn't get it. They didn't care and they made light of it. They said, ah, the wedding, I can take it or leave it. There was, it reminds me of a story. Um, there was a man who was walking down the street and he ran into Spurgeon just a couple hundred years ago. And he said to Spurgeon, he said, you know, he had heard that, you know, Spurgeon was this famous preacher in England. And he said, Spurgeon, I just, I don't, I don't really accept your God. I'm an agnostic. Spurgeon said, ah, oh, but agnostic, that's a Greek word. We speak English. What you mean to say is you're an ignoramus. <laughs> that's what it means. Here's this first point that I want you to really understand. That, that is the problem of these people, these rejects. They are far too easily satisfied. They are far too easily satisfied. This applies to Christians as well, by the way. Why don't you read your Bible? Why don't you tell others about Jesus? You say, well, I'm scared, or I, I just don't know why I do it. Or I... The answer is because you're far too satisfied with so much less. I think it was C.S. Lewis who drew this picture. He said, it's like the tourist who had never been to the beach. Maybe this is Oklahoma. Has anybody here never been to the beach? Raise your hand if you've never been to the beach. Some of you guys 
got to check it out. It's pretty cool. Right? So he says it's like the tourist who's never been to the beach. First time he goes and he's got his umbrella and he's got his lawn chair in his hand. And as he's walking down almost to the shoreline, he stops in front of a building. And on the wall, there is this giant poster. And on the poster is painted a picture of the beach. And he's so entranced by the picture that he unfolds his lawn chair and he sits down on it and he pops his umbrella up and he just waits there. And he's just staring at the picture of the water and he misses the entire vacation. Lewis says, why do we chase immorality? It's not because we're seeking too much, but it's because we're seeking too little. Listen to this from his sermon called The Weight of Glory. He says, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. This guy, he says, no, I've got to go look at my cows one more time. And this other, th this other guy says, man, I'd come to the wedding. I'm sure it's a blast, but I've got this stuff at home that I really need to go look at again. I need to go hold that controller in my hand one more time. I need to go stare at that screen one more time. I need to go pick up this thing and carry it over here and put it over here. I need to look at all the storehouse of my goods. In fact, I need to find out if they're safe. I need to go increase my security. I need to go build another store barn because I got too much stuff and I got to go put the stuff in that store barn. I got to get security for that store barn. I'd come to the wedding, but I just got all these things to do. To be honest, Brenda, if you're honest, our silly ambitions and our worldly desires you think that Christ, you secretly think that Christ has told you to abandon your desire. But you're wrong. You are commanded to seek the real fulfillment of that desire. Someone says, but my desires are too great. I cannot become a Christian. No, friend, your desires are too small. Your sins that you pet and you play with and whatever category it is for you, whether it's an obsession with things or money or pornography or some kind of idolatry, whatever the greed or lust is in your heart or this, this secret grudge that you love to hold and think about, that thought of hypocrisy that you just go cycling over and over in your mind. See, you're too easily satisfied with these things and God is wanting to offer you so much more. There's so much more. You've rejected God's offer. He's come to you again. He's reminded you of how great it is to become a, a participant, to be invited to this great wedding that is taking place in heaven. It's like someone had invited you to eat at an all-you-can-eat steakhouse, and they're going to pay for your way, and on the way there you stopped and ate at Taco Bell, which is the worst, by the way. If you don't believe me, just read up some of the news on the quality of their meat. Well, at my wedding, which was many moons ago, and uh, some of you are like, no, you're young, brother. Well, everybody knows who's a parent. Before you had kids, it's like an, it's like an ancient thing. If you forget all that stuff that happened before you had kids. I've met some of my friends, you know, in high school. We, I didn't go to my 10-year reunion, but... I've seen them on social media, and they'll say, hey, you remember when we did this? And I think, I have no idea what you're talking about. I mean, I, <laughs> there's no hard drive space left. It's all been filled up with baby pictures. But some time ago, as my pictures tell me, uh, at our wedding, which, by the way, my in-laws paid for completely, praise God for that. There was a couple of amens. <laughs> We had this huge reception. It was, a, it was a buffet of red snapper and filet mignon, if you can believe that. That was good stuff. Now, somebody invited you to that. An all-you-can-eat 
buffet of filet mignon and red snapper said, you don't got to pay the ticket. I'm just giving it to you. Aren't you going to come? What TV show would keep you from coming to that reception? <laughs> well, brother, there's a rerun on. I got to stay home and watch it. Maybe next time. You don't realize, friend, that you are missing real joy. Real joy. Some of you even right now, you don't even know what I'm talking about. You're sitting there with a frown on your face. Adrian Rogers says, looks like you got weaned by a dill pickle. There's no joy in your heart because you've been seeking after so many things that are less than God. And God says, just look up to the heavens. I don't want to just keep you from enjoying life. I want to give you life abundantly. I want to teach you what it's about. Who do you think created the rainbow? I wondered this a couple of years ago whenever I started having kids and, and we painted the nursery and it was colorful and beautiful. And then I walked into my boring bedroom, beige on the wall. I thought, what is this? What happens when we grow up? We forget colors. We go blind. You got to rage against the beige, friend. Color comes from God. He created it. Fun comes from God. He created it. Sexual fulfillment comes from God. He created it. He's the maker of the stars. Satan didn't make anything. Don't be fooled by the lie. God is inviting you to a wedding. Are you coming? Or are you rejecting it? You reject Listen to this psalm. Psalm 36 is one of my favorite passages. Psalm 36, verse 7. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures, for with thee is the fountain of life. Did you know the Bible said that? You've been trying to fill your face with spiritual Taco Bell. You're not getting anything out of that. Here the psalmist is saying, oh God, God, there's so much joy in your presence. I just want to be filled. I want to drink from that river again. Would you bring me in? Psalm 16, verse 11 says, thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Do you see that heart in the king here in his invitation? I mean, they wouldn't come. And he said, look, it's ready. I've done all the work. My oxen and fatlings are killed and all things are ready. Come, won't you come into the marriage? But they made light of it. Not a big deal. Eh, I don't want to go to church again. I mean, it, I just got too many other things going on. I don't want to be around God's, but I don't want to open God's word again. I don't want to sing those sims again. I don't want to praise him again. He's forgotten what it's about. It's come empty to you. You don't get it. You've lost it. Would you find it again in your soul and come and drink from the water of life that God is inviting you to taste those songs that we sang this evening just a few minutes ago. Did they sink down into your soul? To God be the glory. There's a second group of people. You see this first group, they just wouldn't come. The servants were out there telling him, would you come, would you come, please come. And they said, no, I don't want to come. No, I don't want to come. They're foolish. But then there was another group of people. Verse 6 says, and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. We'll call this group the rebels. Now, I hope you see the picture here. Overall, is, is, it, is this kind of just summary throughout history how God came to man. And you remember when he spoke to Abraham, as the scriptures tell us, and he called to himself a people, and he gave him a promise, and he made him a covenant. And through him came this great nation that God selected and set apart and said, I'm going to make you my special treasure. I want to make you the bearers of light to go into the world. And he sent him prophets, the servants. But so many of them rejected God. And then some of them actually killed them, killed the servants, killed the prophets. This statement to me is hard to imagine. I mean, just imagine it for a second. Somebody comes and says, hey, 
there's an amazing party going on. There's this incredible festival. There's this feast. The king wants you to come. He's made it all ready. It's free. Here's your invitation. Don't you want to come? And then the person who's getting that invitation says, no, I don't want to come. And then he kills the one who made the invitation. Is that, does that even make sense? It's unthinkable. They abused and murdered the servants who were inviting them to a wedding. Now, Jesus, remember, he's telling the story. Okay, he's talking to a mixed group of people. There's a lot of religious people there. And they're not happy with what he's saying. In fact, if you just skip ahead to the end of the story, you know what it says in verse 15? The Pharisees then went and they took counsel. They started conspiring how they could try to trap Jesus. They did not like this parable. And you can imagine as somebody sitting there in the crowd, Jesus tells the story and then he gets to that part where he says, and then some of them killed the servants. You just imagine somebody saying, oh, Jesus. <laughs> they wouldn't do that. That's not what would happen. You wouldn't kill someone who is inviting you to a wedding. Everybody knows that. And then Jesus looks at them and says, really? Then why did you murder the prophets? What are you going to do with me? What are you going to do to me? And this group of people backing up into the shadows, hardening their heart, hating the words coming out of his mouth. Some of you may be hating the words coming out of the scripture even right now, and your heart is closing in, and the darkness is taking over, and the whisperer from the dark is saying, don't believe it, don't accept it, don't listen. They conspired. They entangled the servants. You see, this group of people is different from the first group. The first group is so apathetic to the offer, they just ignored the servants over and over again. And they became this group of rejects. The second group were actually motivated. They went beyond passive and said, we're going to do something to stop this guy. We don't like the servants. We don't like the wedding. We're tired of hearing about it. And so we're going to actually trap you in a place and then we're gonna murder you. We think that's a good idea. And again, you just think that's unthinkable. It's impossible. How could somebody grasp it? Somebody as nice and as kind and as loving, as forbearing as Jesus, who would do such a thing? And yet the story goes on to say that they took Christ and they conspired against him. They arrested him in the night. They forced a crown of thorns on his head in mockery. They beat him. They manipulated the crowds to shout out, crucify him. They stripped him. They nailed him to a cross. They watched him die. They did it. What was his crime? Now, what did God do? Jesus goes on in the story, verse 7. He says, When the king heard thereof, he was wroth. You think the king was happy about that? He sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers, and he burnt up their city. If you think that God is going to sit idly by while the wicked continue in their rebellion and not execute his justice, then you're following the wrong God. God is not some grandpa sitting in a chair just waiting for everybody to come around. God is holy, the Bible says. In fact, when the scriptures talk about the nature and attributes of God, there's one that seems to rise above the rest. Whenever the angels and the creatures in heaven cry out to God, they say, holy, holy, holy. The word holy, by the way, means to be totally other. It is the sense of God that is absolutely different from us. God is nothing like us. We bear his image. He gives us qualities that we might grow close to him, but God is eternal. God is a creator. God is good. God is just. 
and he will execute his justice. He will avenge his servants. Friend, this should be a great comfort to you. Thank you, God, that you will not let evil prevail in this world. You see the horrors that are happening around you. I don't need to go on a monologue about all the kinds of different perverted sins that are happening right under our noses. The uncounted millions of people that we have killed in the name of convenience. And we call it abortion. Do you think that God will sit idly by while his missionaries go forth into the nations and proclaim the gospel and are persecuted for righteousness sake, are arrested, put in prisons, or their churches are burned and people are dying in the streets? Do you think that God will not execute justice? No, friend, he will. He will. And you need to be very careful that you're not among that group of rebels. You need to be very afraid because God is holy. He is holy. Notice when he says in verse 8, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready. It's ready. Praise God. But they which were bidden were not worthy. They wouldn't take it. They killed the servants. They rejected the invitation. So he tells more of his servants. Now listen, this is where we really get excited. He says, go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. Oh, praise God, the invitation to this wedding is universal. Everyone is invited to this wedding. God is not willing that anyone should perish. He wants them all to come to repentance. Praise God that you sitting in that pew right now have been given that offer, though you were far from God, though you were of another place, another people, another tribe, another tongue. You had no worth, no value in your own. You had no claim to that merit. You had no invitation to that wedding. And God said, would you invite that person to come? He called us. He sent his servants. Find as many as you can. As many as you can. Isaiah 45, verse 22, listen to this verse. God says, look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Say amen. God is on a redemption mission. And he is looking at every soul. He is looking at every person. He's looking at you tonight. He's looking at your neighbor across the street, the one that you ignore when you walk into your house. God is looking to them. He is caring for them. He is desiring that they should know Christ. God is looking at the other nations, some who have been tortured, some who are impoverished, some who are facing malnourishment that you and I could not possibly fathom, but God cares for them. He loves them, and he wants them to know Christ, and he's calling you, friend. If you've been saved, listen, if you know Christ as your personal Savior, you have a mission in life. You have a purpose. It is to go forth as his servant and proclaim the gospel to the nations. Amen. All nations, all people. But where do we stop, brother? You don't. Preach the gospel to every creature. But what if, I mean, come on. Maybe not everybody. everybody. But what if they don't like what we have to say? Well, they, some of them killed the servants. And Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be my disciple, listen, stop, stop where you are. Don't take another step. If you're going to be my disciple, don't follow me yet. Think about what you're about to do, because if you're going to be my disciple, you need to first deny yourself, and then you need to pick up that cross, the cross of suffering, the cross of shame, the cross of persecution, and eventually the cross of death, and you're going to have to follow me every day. God didn't come to promise you prosperity and wealth in this life. things that we have been blessed with come and go. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God if you have a house to live in, if you have a car to drive, if you have three meals a day. Praise God if you have healthy children. Praise God. People in the world don't have these things. And you should give him glory. You should give him thanks. But then God blesses us that we might be a blessing to others. And sometimes that channel gets stopped and we begin to hoard it and we get a hold and we think it's about me. It's about us. It's not about them. And God says, break forth. Give what you have been given. Become an offering. 
He's not going to force you. He wants you to be a willing vessel. He loves a cheerful giver. Christ was willing. Christ was willing. God, did, God the Father didn't twist Jesus' arm to go to the cross. Christ was willing. John 10, I lay my life down willingly. I lay it down. I give it up. He had a claim to authority. He had a claim to power. He had a claim to wealth. He had a claim to all the things that heaven could afford, but he laid it down voluntarily. He laid it down, friend. He laid it down so that he could become a servant, so that he could become an offering, so that he could become a sacrifice. And the Christians of this world, some people in this room tonight are Christians, and God is saying, will you follow? Will you follow the example that Christ has set? Will you go? Will you go? Will you be one of these servants that go to the highways and the hedges? Oh, I want to be one of those people. I want to be one of those people, but God, I get stopped by my own sinfulness and I get carried away by my own fears and my own rebellion. And I, I just like the first group of people, I get so too easily satisfied. And there's so much more. Let's go quickly now to the third group. The servants went out, they gathered everybody, as many as they found, both good and bad, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said, then, friend, how, how came it down here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Now let me just tell you, in this culture, in this, in this ancient world, in this society, whenever a master would create something this, this uh, special, this kind of a banquet that was to be celebrated, uh, he would often invite people to come and he would give them as a gift a garment, a special piece of clothing to wear to this event. It wasn't like they had to buy it. They didn't have to bring it themselves. They were given it as a gift. And when they came, they would wear that as a sign of respect paid to the king or to the master. And the servants go out and they offer all these things and the people that are in now, they're all looking around, they're having a great time. But one of those guys is not wearing the wedding garment that he was offered. And the king comes in. He says, what are you doing here? Did you not get the wedding garment that I offered you? Well, yeah, I never got it. But you didn't put it on. Well, yeah, I didn't put it on. Look, the Bible says he had nothing to say. There was no good answer that he could give. What does this mean? What are we talking about here? This third group of people, we're going to call the religious. I put it in quotes because, listen, I'm not saying that religion is a bad thing. The Bible in James, for example, chapter 1 says pure religion is to go and help the widow and the orphan, to go and do wise, to keep yourself spotless from this world. Religion is, is man's response and, and its best attempt to serve a living God. But religion can, can often constrain us from following God's spirit. Religion can become lifeless and cold, and many people are religious that don't know Christ. Religion can make us lazy and blind. You see, there are those that came into this wedding, but they were not wearing the robe of righteousness, and he was speechless. What is this robe of righteousness? Listen to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. He says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. What is the robe that they were supposed to be wearing at this wedding? It was the robe of righteousness. Where does the righteousness come from? It is an offer. It is a grace. It is a gift. Whenever in, in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned and they face judgment and God was looking at them, they were wearing, you remember, their fig leaves, this symbol of their attempt to hide and, and to present themselves to God. And it was foolish and it was not going to last. And, and God kills this animal and he takes the skin of the animal and the Bible says that he covers them with it. That covering, that covering symbolically presents to us Christ. Jesus died and his perfect righteousness is offered to you and to I as a gift to cover us, to cover us, to cleanse us so that we can invite, be invited into the presence of God and not be ashamed. 
But see, there are those that would be standing there and they wouldn't have that robe on. They didn't have the blood of Christ covering their sin. They had nothing but their own empty religion. And when God comes to speak, they will be speechless. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Listen to this. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. There is going to be a day, friend, when God will judge the living and the dead and books will be open and God will judge them out of the things that are written in those books. And the law of God will go for some people say, oh man, when I get to, when I get to stand in front of God, I have some questions. Why did this happen in my life? Why did you let this happen? What was going on over here, God? But you know what? The scripture says that whenever everyone is gathered together and God looks out and his law is proclaimed, nobody will be saying a word. You're not going to have anything to say. There will be no excuse that you can offer God as to why you didn't receive the free gift of everlasting life, as to why you didn't repent and turn to him when he called you over and over and over when he wooed you with his wedding invitation and you said no because all your stuff was more important and you said I want to sin, I want to go on into this life of my own selfishness. There will be no excuse that you can offer to God because he's made it possible, he's made it simple, he's made it clear so that you can be saved. Even tonight as we sit here in this room, that excuse has been ripped away from your life because your ears have heard the gospel that there is a living God, that the Son, the Christ, has come to shed his blood and to be a ransom for many. For you, friend, if you would call upon his name tonight in faith and say, God, save a sinner like me, please cover me in your blood. He will give you that cover. He will give it to you. Put it on. Would you put on the Lord Jesus Let's look at this fourth group of people. This is the group that was invited and they came in. They celebrated. They were wearing the garment that the master had given them. They received the robe. Isaiah says this is a garment of salvation, a robe of righteousness. Listen, Christian, to me. Listen to me. You have on your body, on your person, on your soul, in your spirit, the very blessing and the very righteousness of God. You're not righteous in yourself. This group that are, we call the righteous, they're not righteous in themselves, but they are righteous before God because the righteousness of Christ is on them. Just like the sin of humanity was placed on Christ, the righteousness of Christ was placed on And you're living now in this body and your flesh is rotting and life is not always easy, but you're looking forward to that day. There's going to be a day when the sun breaks forth, the light is going to come in and there's going to be a celebration and we're going to look around and see each other clothed in righteousness and we will rejoice. Don't grow weary, friend, in well-doing because you will reap if you faint not. Rock Kazakh, Amats, the Hebrew battle war cry. Be strong and of good courage. Your redemption draws near. The burden that you carry now is light. I know it seems heavy, but just listen to me. It's light and it will only last for a moment. And the suffering will end. And the wedding will come. And the joy. The joy will culminate into a celebration in a city. A city that will come down from heaven. You're going to see that city. You're going to be that city. You're going to look around. And you're going to see God's work. And you're going to say, I had no idea. I had no idea. God, you're so amazing. You're so glorious. You're so wonderful. It was all worth it. It was all worth it. How could I have ever doubted you? How could have I ever thought one way to look to the left or the right? How could have I ever slung back, God, oh, you were worth it. You were worth it. You see those creatures in heaven, the, 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 the righteous in Revelation, the, the elders, the 24, throwing down their crowns and saying, holy God, holy. They're not just repeating some cycle, some empty religion, some ritual. They're saying, God, you're so holy. You're so beautiful. I don't know what to say. They're responding to something that is happening inside of them. Have you ever had an experience like that? Maybe for you who was reading a really good book or seeing a really good movie or having a really good encounter with somebody and you could not be silent you had to tell somebody right you, you came out you had to tell somebody I got to tell you this was amazing this was incredible nobody's forcing you to say those words 
You're saying it because you are overcome with joy. Your hurts are in There may be much that you go through in this life, but dear brother or sister, there is no pain. There is no weight that can keep you from that presence, that Holy One, to be brought inside, to be brought in behind the veil. We will be at that wedding. We will be at that wedding. The bride. The bride. The bride will be brought into that wedding. And you and I, friend, we will be brought in. We will be spotless. We will be covered in white. And the bride comes in and all the audience gasp in shock. They stand in honor and they look at the bride and say, wow, she's beautiful. Do you know the Bible tells us that all the angels, that all the creation, that the uncounted trillions upon trillions of creatures of God will be surrounding the bride at that wedding and they will be in shock and they will lift up their voices and say, wow. How could you do this work? What is this redemption? What is this love that you have? What is this mercy? They don't know, but friend, you and I, we will know. You will know. And you can know right now, friend. We'll taste of that mercy. Drink from that water. Be strong. Be strong. The bride will be presented to the king, dressed in white, pure, brilliant, His people will shine as the noonday sun. They will burn in his glory. But there is another group of people, see, the damned, the condemned, the lost. They will burn in his wrath. Verse 13 says, And the king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. I guarantee you that you are in one of these four groups. You've been invited. You've been invited. And you get to decide which one of those four that you want to be. I want to ask our musicians to come forward. What do you want to be? Do you want to be the rejects? You got more important things to do? Do you want to be the rebels? Or do you want to sneak in and pretend that you're one of God's people? Or do you want to be clothed in the righteousness of your Savior, Jesus? Which one do you want to be?